Happy Feast Day, everybody! Today, we celebrate the Feast of St. Drosten, the wonderful miracle worker, the wonderful helper of those among us who struggle spiritually, those among us, clergy and monastics, but laity as well, who suffer from some sort of spiritual struggle, from some sort of a spiritual blindness. And I was very much looking forward to sharing with you all details of his life and my love for St. Drosten. However, on the same day, we also celebrate St. Sophroni of Essex. I cannot believe I've lived to say those words. Saint Sophroni. I've gotten so accustomed to calling him Father Sophroni. I've gotten so accustomed to relate to him in my own private prayer as Father Sophroni that it feels awkward to now refer to him as Saint Sophroni. But it is such a blessed awkwardness, and I am so filled with gratitude that I have lived to see this day, and I have lived to be able to celebrate his feast in our church. Saint Sophroni is so important to me. He has literally kept me alive spiritually and mentally for such a long time. And I owe him so much, it would be impossible to share everything that my heart wants to share in one video. So I am just going to close my eyes and allow Christ to tell me what I need to share with you today. And let's trust that on a different occasion, Christ will give me more and a better opportunity to share more with all of you. When I said that Saint Sophroni kept me alive, I meant that in a most literal way. If I allow my heart to speak openly about Saint Sophroni, the one thing, the link between my life and him is my own death and the thought of death that was taking over my life, invading and suffocating my life at the time when Saint Sophroni stepped in and saved me. There is a way in which death and fear of death can just take over one's life and can become absolutely crippling to the point where this fear of a theoretical death that one day may occur becomes incarnate and the soul and sometimes the mind and even the body of that person can collapse into physical death. When Saint Sophroni stepped into my life through his writings and then immediately through my prayer to him, I was on the verge of that collapse. I was on the verge of letting go and suffocating under the weight of this fear, crippling fear of death. And I've learned from Saint Sophroni that death can be a curse but that death, like any other curse, can also be a saving grace. I've learned from Saint Sophroni the distinction between a curse or a cross that kills you in a bad way and a cross that kills you in a good life-giving way. I've learned from Saint Sophroni that there is a death-inducing fear of death, but that there is also a life-inducing fear of death. How I've learned that, I don't really know. I remember reading him, reading his books, and feeling that life is being poured onto me. All I can remember is thinking that this man, was saying exactly 
what I needed in order to feel alive. I remember reading him with the hunger with which I would also eat bread for my physical body. I remember feeling empty and dry and just about to collapse into my death and just running back into my cell and just opening his books at any given page and reading, reading more and more and more and feeling that somehow, just by reading those words, life comes back into me. And then I could take that life and I could turn it into prayer. And before I knew it, that fear of death that suffocated me and tore me apart from Christ became the very nourishment of a prayer that got me closer and closer to Christ. And by getting me closer to Christ, it got me closer and closer to life. I've learned in this sort of experiential sort of way that there is a bad fear of death and a life-giving fear of death. I've learned to discern between a good life and a bad life, a good death and a bad death. And I've learned to feed within myself the instinct so I may discern which way lies life and which way lies death. People who have experienced what I'm talking about, people who live their lives with death in their nostrils, know that you either develop this instinct where you are able to discern the hidden life or the hidden death in any given instance, behavior or person, or you die. And people who live their lives with their nostrils infused with this fear of death know that you get to a point where like a wild animal, like a wild beast, you are able to instantly, based on some sort of instinct, you are able to immediately smell, smell life or death in anything. The way wild animals in the forests distinguish poisonous fruit from good fruit just by smelling them. I've learned from Saint Sophroni, that what I had perceived and fought as a curse, this fear of death, can become the life-giving grace in my life. And it can become the one criterion, just meditation on one's mortality, just praying with one's death before one's eyes, just living one's life with death always in your nostrils, in your heart. Death can become the life-giving criterion that immediately and without fail tells you which way is the path of life and which way is the path of bad death. When you taste a drop of life, then somehow death loses its strength and its hold over you is no longer suffocating. When you taste a bit of life, what happens, and I don't know how, and I don't know why, but I do know that it happens, just like Saint Sophroni and Saint Siloan teach us, when you taste the drop of life, your entire being is reoriented towards life. Your will, your strength, your desire, your purpose, everything that you are forgets about the suffocating grip of death that had held you in its power up to that moment. And all that you are 
simply wants to taste that life once again. The only fear that exists in your life once you've tasted real life is that you may miss an opportunity to be open and receive another drop of life, another experience of life. You just forget about death. And everything in you craves for another instant, another second, another drop of life. And I remember now, as I'm speaking to you, St. Siloan's words, Oh, my Christ, my heart tasted you, and now I crave for you, and now I long for you. Where are you? my Christ, my life. When death is accepted as a grace, as a gift to you from Christ, as a God-given and a life-giving cross and grace, that fear of death will become as the guiding light, the criterion in your life that will lead you to an experience of real life. And when that happens, you've reached a state of complete and absolute freedom from fear. And nothing that has to do with this world, including death in this world, can touch you anymore. The only fear that takes root in your heart and grows stronger and stronger is the fear that you may miss Christ. You may miss by not opening yourself up. You may miss another opportunity to taste that life. Father Sofroni doesn't run away from the realities of his life. There is no attempt on his part to pretend that his life is anything else than what it is. There is no attempt on his part to pretend that he is something else, someone else, somehow else than exactly who and how he is at any given moment. This is why he does not shy away from this potentially crippling experience of death. But rather than turning away and pretending that it doesn't affect himself, rather than trying to find ways in which to dilute this fear, this experience, he addresses it fully on and he fights it with all his might, with everything that he has. And this is something he does in everything in his spiritual life. And this approach, this technique of living one's life has created for us a monumental saint. This fearlessness in confronting who he is and how he is has created a monumental saint that can lead us into the depths of our own beings. There is something extremely rare in St. Sophroni. There is this cold-blooded, perfectly controlled balance between a fullness of the spiritual life and a fullness of perfection of discernment. He throws himself in the realities of his spiritual life with the madness of an artist. And he lives his spiritual life with the madness and lack of safety nets that is proper to a genius, to a genial artist. But on the other hand, he very coolly, coldly, perfectly balances this madness of one's spiritual life with discernment. The madness, the courage, the fearlessness comes from, come from his 
character as an artist, but then he also has the balance of discernment, which comes from humility and obedience and the entire experience of a decades long life of monastic life. And this balance is so rare. And in his case, it was pushed to its absolute extremes to the point that they created this crucified being that perfectly reflects the image of Christ. And that's why Saint Sophronie is such an anomaly amongst us humans and even among saints because he's almost in a different category. The way he spoke about Saint Siloan and very humbly said that there is only one in a generation like Saint Siloan. We can definitely apply his words to himself. And what made him one in a generation is this cold, otherworldly balance between allowing himself the fearlessness and the freedom of an artist in throwing himself in his spiritual experiences while perfectly controlling it with the humility and obedience of the experience of monastic life. This balance, you can see it in his advice that one should push oneself as close to the edge of the cliff, of the chasm, as possible. But when you get there, you stop and you go and you have a cup of tea with him in prayer and in reading his life and his wisdom. And then, once you've cooled yourself, once you've regained control over yourself, once the madness of the experience has lifted, then you can start the pushing, the journey once again. It's the same balance that you see also in St. Siloan's teaching, given to him from the mouth of Christ himself. Keep your mind in hell. Stay on that cliff, just looking over the cliff, looking over into the chasm. Keep your mind in that hell, but do not despair. So do not go one step further once you've gotten to the edge of that cliff. Stop. Stop and allow the troops to reassemble around you. Allow yourself to regroup in the comfort and the safety of the discernment that comes from obedience, from humility and the 2,000 years experience of Christian life. It is in this balance, in this state of tension, that Saint Sophroni says we should not live ever. It is on this cross that saints like Saint Siloan and Saint Sophroni are being molded and shaped. This experience of being stuck in a place of tension, of leaving one's life on a cross, leads to a gradual deepening of one's understanding of oneself, leads to a gradual growth in one's spiritual strength. And the extent, the limit of this growth in one's spiritual life is entirely up to us and is entirely dependent on our endurance and our patience and our um, fearlessness. At any given moment, the fullness of God's life, the fullness of what God is, is available to us as a potential. 
But whether or not that potential is actualized in us is entirely dependent on us being able, having the courage and the madness and the desperate love and need to be one with Christ to keep on going, to keep on playing with this painful balance between making one step, taking one step further onto that ridge of the cliff and then stopping and then yet another step and then stopping and yet another step and then stopping and as you do this as you keep yourself on this cross in this shaping molding forming place of tension you learn the depth of your hell but also the heights of the heaven that is available to you. And you can go as far as you decide, as you have the courage or the madness or the love, the desire, the desperate desire to be one with God, one with Christ. The main temptation, strange as it may seem, is the experience of freedom that comes from this crucifixion, a freedom in relation to oneself and in relation to this life here. And that is frightening because that freedom is based on a new awareness a new understanding that I am nothing, that at any given moment in my life, no matter how much I think I have grown, no matter how much knowledge I believe I have received, I am still nothing, I still know nothing, and I can vanish in a second. This is a different, frightening kind of freedom because it cuts you loose from any safety nets in this world. It is frightening because it is based on the understanding that who you are today will no longer be here tomorrow and that your knowledge of God available to you today will no longer be available to you tomorrow because by tomorrow you will have grown into your understanding of God. And by implication that also means that who God is for your heart today is not who God is for your heart tomorrow because the more knowledge you receive, that knowledge will change who you are and your own self-understanding of who you are and also of who God is. It is a frightening experience of freedom because it comes from the awareness. It is based on the foundation of the knowledge that I am nothing and my knowledge is nothing and my understanding of God is nothing. No matter how far I go in this life, who I am is not yet the depth of the mystery of my being. My knowledge of God is not yet true knowledge of God and my understanding, my image of God is not yet a perfect reflection of God himself. Who I am, my knowledge and who God is for my heart at any given moment is both nothingness and an absolute necessary step so that tomorrow I may advance, I may deepen 
this understanding of myself and of God himself. In practical terms, in practical spiritual terms, this means that at any given moment you must be fully aware of the potential hidden in you, but also that that fullness is not yet actualized. Again, what that means practically is that you must never build your salvation on what is available to you today because who you are today is dust and the nothingness of dust. Your salvation cannot be built on the dust, on the sand of the poor, imperfect knowledge that is available to us today. We must use this nothingness to be gradually, increasingly more open to God, so we can receive gradually, increasingly more knowledge. And in that process, we shall gradually, increasingly understand more about ourselves, grow more into who we are, actualize more that hidden potential, to get to know the mystery of who we are and of who God is, because all of us have that potential imprinted upon us through baptism and chrismation and perfected by receiving Holy Communion. Never settle for today. Always use today as a trampoline for tomorrow. Always use what is available to you today as a blessed tool for the deeper revelation of tomorrow. Never build an idol of who you are today, but allow who you are today to die so that who you can be tomorrow can be resurrected in you. And then tomorrow, allow that new self to become a tool for who you can be the day after tomorrow, and so on and so forth, until you cannot push yourself anymore, and you have to stop for a while, until your wings grow stronger, until your discernment settles down. And then with these new tools, you can restart the process again and again. And this is not just about who you are, but also about who God is. <sighs> Potentially, we are all Christians because God is alive in our hearts. We've received him through baptism, through chrismation, and by consuming his real body and real blood in Holy Communion. Potentially, God, the real living God, is in us. But in a reality, in the reality of today, of the here and now, this potential is not yet fully actualized. So if at any given moment, if you ever stop and decide that this is God, this is all that I can know about God, and this is who God is. In that moment, you have replaced the living creator with an idol, a man-made God, a brain-made God. And this is when you fall. This is the freedom that I'm talking about, the frightening freedom of becoming aware that everything I am and everything I know about myself and about God is, in fact, in reality, nothingness, but in potential, everything. Keep going and keep yourselves open, step 
on the knowledge of today and keep yourself open to receive the knowledge of tomorrow. Use everything that the being that you are today has available in order to open yourself to the being whom you can become tomorrow. Pray in the complete honesty of your heart to the God whom you know today while remaining fully aware that because of the imperfect knowledge of our brains and our beings, that God will be revealed tomorrow as being an idol because the God of tomorrow will be the God of a deeper knowledge, of more perfect knowledge, and therefore closer to who God himself is. Never abandon the humility and the humbleness and the obedience of the dust that we are, but never lower the expectations, the hopes of your prayers beyond the fullness of the revelation. Keep yourself grounded in your nothingness, in the humility of your nothingness, but ask for the perfection of the life, the fullness of life of God himself. Keep yourself in the tension of your cross, hoping for the fullness of the revelation which is fed, nourished by the experience of that cross. Keep yourself in the awareness of the depth of your hell and from the depth of that hell look up and pray for, ask for with complete certainty the fullness of heaven itself. Because although we are indeed nothing, we were given the potential to indeed become one with He who is all. And although today I am nothing, in eternity I can become one with being, with the experience of being, with existence, with life himself. If I could, if I had the opportunity, I would like to talk about Saint Sophroni until tomorrow and until the day after tomorrow and eternity, because he has given me everything. May his blessing enter our hearts like an arrow and pierce and kill what needs to be killed in our hearts so that what needs to catch root in our hearts, those life-giving flowers of grace may finally catch root and grow and take over our sinfulness so that we may be reborn, truly reborn for Christ, for who we have the potential to be and for the kingdom. Amen, my brother and my sister. Amen.